Welcome to our fourth webinar in the series, Greek Painting in Context. I'm Jennifer Niles, the director of the American School here in Athens, and I am together with my co-moderator, Professor Dimitris Plantos of Athens University, who will handle the Q&A at the end of our webinar. We welcome you to use the tab at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions, and we will get to as many of them as possible. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Sheremy Bundrick, whom I have known since she was a graduate student at Emory University. It was there that she earned her BA, MA, and PhD in art history and worked for many years in their Michael C. Carlos Museum. She spent the summer of 2003 with the American School's summer session and began teaching at the University of South Florida, where she sailed through the ranks and is now a full professor in art history. Professor Bundrick's first book, published by Cambridge, examined the role of music in classical Athens. And her second scholarly book concerns Greek vases in Italy. It came out in 2019 from the University of Wisconsin Press. These two books and many, many major articles on Greek art have established her reputation as a scholar who looks closely at imagery and considers it in the context in which it was found rather than made. What you may not know about Jeremy is that she's also written a wonderful novel also about paintings, but in this case, those of Vincent van Gogh. Entitled Sunflowers, it is a delightful read. Professor Brunrick is here to speak to us about painting on Athenian vases and why they so appeal to their wealthy Etruscan buyers, to whom we are grateful for having preserved for us so much of Greek painting that otherwise would have been lost. Welcome, Jeremy. Joining me today, it is such a pleasure to be with you. Today we are turning our attention to painted pottery and we are crossing the sea over to Etruria where thousands of Athenian vases and thousands of Greek pots have been found over the centuries. Last week we got a little taste of the subject of Greek vases in Etruria because Dr. Meyer showed us the Kiji vase which was exported from Corinth to Etruria in the seventh century. And today I am picking up the story with Athenian pottery that crossed the sea in the sixth and fifth centuries. And we are going to think about the incorporation of Athenian pottery into Etruscan settings. This is of course a massive topic of that we have not nearly enough time to discuss. 
Many scholars have written on it besides me. I'm not the first, I won't be the last to cover this fascinating topic. But today in the brief amount of time that we have, I would like to bring up some key concepts that I believe are instrumental to the discussion of Athenian pottery exported to Etruria. And then we will turn to three specific case studies that I believe exemplify this dynamic and look at those more closely in terms of context in the archeological sense and in terms of fine spot and context in the historical sense in terms of customs and other sorts of issues. So in terms of my uh, key concepts, the first term I'd like to bring up is mobility. Obviously, I mean this very literally because vases were highly mobile objects that did cross the sea from Athens to Etruria and changed hands many times along the way. But we can also speak of mobility in a more metaphorical sense in terms of the mobility of meaning and function and setting and even information because I think the mobility of information is quite important to the trade in Athenian vases as well. And we will be speaking more about that. Secondly, we can speak about transformation. As Athenian vases crossed over into Etruscan territory and shifted from export to import, they also transformed along the way as well. I use the terms Etruscanized and Etruscanization to talk about this process as the opposite of Hellenization but other sorts of terms will do as well. So for example, in the conclusion chapter of my book, I bring in the word globalization, which is a term that other scholars have used recently for other material. The Etruscanization of Athenian vases can be very literal. And an example of that would be the addition of an inscription to the vase. So for example, the very large and very beautiful cup by Altos from Tarquinia in the museum still at Tarquinia, where you have the inscription around the foot in Etruscan that dedicates it to the Tinas Cliniar, the sons of Tinia. But there are other modes of transformation as well. Simply placing an Athenian vase into an Etruscan tomb is a means of transformation. You're transforming its setting, its function, its meaning. And one could even argue its identity. Is it even a Greek object anymore once it makes its way into an Etruscan tomb? Or is its Etruscanization complete? That's something we can think about. Thirdly, intentionality. The actions of Etruscan consumers in selecting vases for acquisition, consumption, and deposition, whether that is in a tomb or in a sanctuary or for use at a home, was not random, and it was not done without thought. In my opinion, both the shapes of vases and their imagery could and did usually factor into the choices. The Greek origin, on the other hand, the Greekness of vases may have as well, although I would caution that this might not always have been the case. The workshops in Athens too exhibited a great deal of intentionality in their choices of shapes and imagery for production and of traders and merchants in their selection of vases for export and sale. None of these parties are behaving randomly, which in turn brings up my fourth key point, which is dialogue, and goes back to a point I was making earlier about the mobility of information as well as of pottery. The Athenian pottery trade was not a unidirectional affair, and the process involved for the Etruscans was not a passive one of consumption, passive consumption, or of Hellenization. Instead, I suggest that the groups of players involved, all of them, whether that's the producers, that is to say the workshops, the middlemen, which would be the traders and the merchants, and the consumers, whether in Etruria or anywhere, are engaging in an active dialogue, either literally or metaphorically, that in turn feeds all of their various choices. The traders would have chosen which vases to transport to Etruria based on their knowledge of consumer demand and what would sell directly through being told or indirectly through just observing what is selling, Athenian workshops would likewise learn of these preferences and that would in turn impact their production choices in one sense or another. Producers and middlemen would have behaved this way in order to minimize risk. They want to sell the vases, this is a business. Consumers in Etruria therefore possess considerable agency or really purchasers anywhere through sheer purchasing power. All of the groups, however, possess considerable agency and the profitable and 
prolific nature of the export trade to Etruria in turn fostered creativity and innovation in the Athenian potter's quarter. Before I go further, I do want to comment on my use of the terms Etruscan and Athenian. The Etruscans were not a homogenous people, despite the fact they share a common language and a religion. There was a great deal of variety among communities in terms of local customs and tastes. And in fact, the dialects are different as well in different parts of Etruria. Similarly, recent research has supported that Athenian workshops were themselves fairly diverse, so that not everyone in the Potter's Quarter was Athenian born and even Greek. I continue to use these terms, however, for convenience. The three specific case studies that I'm sharing today, which we will now turn to, represent three different sites, three different moments in the vase trade to Etruria, and three different types of vases and scene types. They also represent three examples of recontextualization of provenance research that I undertook, and as such, they are very special to me. We will begin on the coast at Tarquinia and Vulci. Let me show you on the map. Here it is. Tarquinia and Vulci are three um, or two very large communities, as you see, located near the coast, and they received very large numbers of imported vases. Our third case study, however, will take us further inland to Foiana della Chiana in Tuscany, which has a, a couple of very interesting excavated tombs, and we will look at one of those today. Let's begin at Tarquinia. In the 1876 volume of the Bulletino dell'Instituto di Correspondenza Archeologica, I'm showing you a page there on the left, Wolfgang Helbig, whose name we will hear a lot today, he was the secretary of the Institute at the time, discusses excavations undertaken by the Marzi brothers that year on their land in Tarquinia in the contrada known as the Ripa Greta. And let me point out to you where that is in the Montorozzi necropolis, it is roughly in this area right here was their land. The Marzis had already been excavating tombs and selling objects for years, as was their legal right at the time, I want to stress. Among their discoveries, for example, had been the very famous tomb of the leopards discovered the previous year in 1875. In this particular report in the Bulletino, Helbig recounts the discovery of four pit graves that in more modern scholarship are known in Italian as tumbe a buca. Each of these, he says, was a hole lined with rectangular slabs of stone with depths ranging from 60 to 70 centimeters. And inside each of these was a black figured amphora serving as a cinerary urn containing the deceased cremated remains, but he says no other objects. Helbig then discusses in his report the four cinerary urns. As was his tendency with higher quality vases that were likely to be sold, often with his help, he lavishes the most attention on an amphora that he says is 39 centimeters in height and is nello stile che antiquario romano chiamano terrenico, that is, of the style which the Roman antiquarians call Tyrrhenian. He then explains that this style exaggerates the principles of the archaic style. Helpfully for our purposes, he then describes every figure on the vase, what they're doing, what they're wearing, and also describes everything in the background. And just to show you on the page, his description begins right here where I'm pointing, goes to the bottom and carries to the next page. So it is indeed an extremely detailed and precise description. As part of my research for my book from 2019, I was mining the Bulletino and other 19th century journals for information about Athenian vases being used as Etruscan cinerary urns. Very helpfully for me, these are mostly digitized today. So I, I did a lot of this work in Rome where I had access to the real journals, but I also did a lot of it in Florida. So I'm very happy for the digitization. And in 2015, I came upon this particular description as part of my work. Helbig does not say the vase is Greek, but I had a hunch, and using that magical tool known as the Beasley Archive Pottery Database, I identified the amphora as a type B belly amphora in the Harvard Art Museums. It is attributed to the very distinctive Athenian potter painter dubbed by Beasley the effector for his mannered style. So the comments that Helbig makes about style of this vase now make a lot of sense when we see who it is that painted it. As I did with the other vases that I'm showing you today, my first step 
was to first check all the published appearances and make sure that no one had found this before me. And there were a couple of cases where I found someone had, uh, but this case, no one had. I contacted then the information to verify that they didn't have anything in their file related to this information and Harvard did not. And I'd like to thank Suzanne Ebbinghaus and Amy Brower for their assistant, assistance with this project. I hope I made them as happy as I was to learn that this was new information. Together with other antiquities, the Amphora had been bequeathed to the Harvard Classics Department by alumnus Henry W. Haynes in 1912. In 1977, it was transferred from the Classics Department to what was then known as the Fogg Art Museum on the Harvard campus. I learned from Suzanne and Amy that Haynes's papers are kept at the Massachusetts Historical Society. So I went there and I examined his travel diary and correspondence from the 1870s. Happily for me, he was in Italy in 1876, just a few months after the emperor was discovered. And an entry in his diary from May 21st, which you see at the top there on the left, says he went to Cornetto for the day. Cornetto is the name for the modern town of Tarquinia as it was known at that time. Even more helpfully, he says in his entry that he met one of the Marzi brothers and saw their collection. He also described this visit in a letter to his mother, which I also found in the file. Unfortunately, he does not describe this particular vase that would have been much too easy. And in fact, he doesn't describe any of the antiquities that he bought. He simply tells his mother that he bought them. But he, um, in my opinion, very easily could have been shown this exact amphora on the day that he went to Cornetto and went to Marzi's and either bought it on the spot or while he was still staying in Rome for a few more months. As with my other examples today, being able to recontextualize the effector's amphora to at least something close to a documented find spot answers one very important question, where did it come from? Because even the information it came from Tarquinia had been lost on the art market through the years, but it inspires new questions too. Let's begin with the amphora's appropriation as a cinerary urn. In the sixth and fifth centuries BCE, cremation was a minority practice at Tarquinia compared to inhumation. However, cremation had a very strong local history stretching back to the early Iron Age in Etruria and in Tarquinia specifically, predating significant Greek contact. Etruscans in Tarquinia and elsewhere in Etruria thought of cinerary urns as not just a simple container, but as a means of revitalizing the dead. Therefore, the selection of cinerary urns made by families must have been very meaningful and not driven only by practicality. The availability of different kinds of containers further implies a degree of consumer choice, although of course something like cost would probably come into play. So for example, in the sixth and fifth centuries, you have uh, imported ceramic ware being used as cinerary urns, locally made pottery being used, um, stone cinerary urns, and even wooden containers, which have since disintegrated. My research corpus from Tarquinia specifically features about 30 Athenian figured vases used as cineraria, of which over two thirds are actually amphorae. Craters and pelicae are also represented, including the very famous and very beautiful red figured bell crater by the Berlin painter with Europa and the bull. As you might guess, most of these vases were found in the 19th century, so the documentation is a bit spotty and the human remains were not kept for analysis. So in the occasions when other grave goods are mentioned, that gives us some clues towards identifying gender, but when there aren't any grave goods, that's impossible pretty much, and age, of course, is also very difficult. However, there are examples found from more recent excavations, and these are very suggestive. The black-figured amphora on the left in the Tarquinia Museum is attributed to the Antimonese painter. It was found in a tumba buca in 1987 as part of a rescue excavation and was a cinerary urn. Both scenes depict combat in progress, and it was, as you see, reconstructed here in the museum, originally capped with a bucaro standard dish as a lid. The cremated remains inside have not been fully published in terms of forensic analysis, but the preliminary report suggests that they belong to a young adult male. And although we do have to be cautious in making very simple assumptions or equations, 
it is very tempting to connect the very strongly masculine iconography on the vase to the persona of the dead, either his actual achievements and deeds or the way his family wanted him to be perceived. As for the local popularity of the amphora shape, while it is certainly a practical form for this purpose, some scholars have suggested that they were meant to recall early Iron Age biconical urns from centuries earlier, like the example there on the right, which also belonged to an adult male and was excavated in a pit grave with other goods. Revitalization of the dead and the anthropomorphization of the urn on the right is suggested here by the lid, which is shaped somewhat like a helmet. The human remains interred in the effector's amphora found in 1876 are of course very long gone. And Helbig says there were no grave goods, so we have no clues as to the deceased gender or age. Both sides of the amphora feature gatherings of gods. The obverse here shows Zeus enthroned, surrounded by Hermes, Dionysus, Poseidon, and a youth. Hermes appears to be departing, moving away from Zeus, but looking back at him with an upraised hand. And I happen to like the effector, so I will just take a second to admire the beautiful added color that we see here on the vase indicating the textiles. And again, Helbig was extremely detailed in how he described these, so I'm, I'm very confident I do not have the wrong vase. The Amphora's reverse depicts Poseidon again in the center, holding a trident and a fish. You can just barely see the fish together with another bearded deity who may be Zeus, two bearded males who, beardless males who lack attributes, and a second bearded man with a fish at left who may be Nereus. Whether the Tarquinian deceased was male or female, the gods on the Amphora would have been viewed as protective and propitious. And if you think about it, they were literally surrounding the deceased who was interred here in the vase. All of these gods, I, for whose Greek names I just gave you, were worshipped in Etruria, of course, under different names, Tenya, Neptunes, Terms, and Fuflums. As in Greece, Terms, the Etruscan Hermes, served as a messenger to the afterlife. So it is possible that the Etruscan viewer read this scene in a funerary context, perhaps as Terms being sent by Tenya to escort the soul of the dead to the next world. Scenes of the gatherings of gods, which may or may not allude to a specific mythical event, there's been discussion about that, uh, they're almost deliberately ambiguous, are very common in the work of the effector throughout his career, which is estimated to go from around 540 to 520 BCE. Three and probably four amphorae with this type of scene were imported into Tarquinia, all of them dated by Haida Mommsen to the effector's earliest phase of work in her magisterial catalog of his work from the 70s. A near twin to the Harvard Amphora remains in Tarquinia there in the upper right in the Museo Nazionale. And I'm sorry about the glare, there is a fluorescent light in the case. That Amphora was discovered by the Bruschi Pagari family on their land, but has no documented context. Found in the 19th century. Its obverse features an enthroned female figure who perhaps can be identified as Hera. An Amphora now in Gotha there in the bottom right has a seated Zeus on both obverse and reverse. Nothing is known of its original Tarquinian context either, only that it was acquired in the late 19th century with the aid of none other than our friend Wolfgang Helbig. A fourth early effector vase almost certainly comes from Tarquinia and it is in the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. It also includes Hermes, only this time with Dionysus and satyrs. If we examine the breadth or known or suspected conveniences in the effector's entire output, we see the large number of exports to central and southern Etruria. And of course, there is massive preservation bias whenever you are talking about distribution, and there are lots of reasons for that. But nonetheless, it can be very helpful in finding patterns. So you see here, for example, 23 vases attributed to this painter from Vulci, that's a very high number compared to other places. 12 from Ovrieto um, is another example. The majority of those vases sent to Etruria are in fact amphorae, although there are a few skipoi and hydriae as well. For example, from Gervisca, those are a couple of drinking vessels. In general, the effector's early and middle stylistic vases as established by Momsen feature a mix of vases sent to Etruria and a mix sent to the Eastern Mediterranean. So for example, Naucratus. However, his later output, if the chronology holds up, 
is almost exclusively dedicated to central and southern Etruria. So we see an interesting shift, um, again, taking into account the uh, preservation bias, there seems to be a shift in his own um, distribution of his vases. And if so, this pattern does reflect what seems to be the overall situation for Athenian figure pottery from this time period in this um, age from the mid uh, sixth century and a couple of decades there as workshops and traders were realizing the profit that could be made through trade with the Etruscans. Potters and painters, potter painters like the effector, we do believe he was both potter and painter, took advantage of a favorable situation by shifting and tailoring his own production. Amphorae with gathering of, gatherings of gods or fighting warriors and earlier or other scenes like he produced are not recognizably Etruscan in their iconography, meaning they're not distinctively Etruscan, but nonetheless, they appealed to Etruscan consumers, so he kept making them. He increasingly seems to have focused his production on the amphora shape, which Etruscans wanted, whether belly amphorae like the one you see from Harvard or the more archaizing ovoid neck amphora shape. Even his distinctive style may have well been a form of what we today would call a personal brand. It is very easy to dismiss the effector as repetitive, and many have, that word shows up in several discussions of his work, but he seems to have been a very savvy businessman who enjoyed a successful career for an extended amount of time. Judging from uh, graffiti on the bottom of many of his vases that we can identify, it seems, as mercantile trademarks, it seems he also maintained steady relationships with certain traders. And I would suggest he obtained information from them that proved useful in his production decisions. Our second case study takes us to Vulci, again, near the coast that received a very large number of imported Athenian vases. And in fact, based on at least the present finds, it seems to have received more Athenian painted vases than any other Etruscan site. In the 1883 volume of the Bulletino dell'Istituto di Correspondenza Archeologica, our friend Wolfgang Helbig reported on the ongoing excavations conducted by Francesca Marcelliani on land belonging to Prince Alessandro Tolonia, east of the ancient city in the Polodrara Necropolis. And um, you can see the Polodrara Necropolis over here on the right in the PowerPoint. This area had already been explored in the late 1820s and early 1830s by Luciano Bonaparte, quite notoriously, I should say, because hundreds of Athenian vases were discovered during the so-called Bonaparte or Canino explorations of, of his particular land. Some things, however, did remain for Marcelliani to find in the 1880s. And in this particular report in the Bolettino, Helbig describes two tombs that he says were found inside the Cucumaletta tumulus. And there are multiple tumuli in that particular necropolis. The largest one is the Cucumella, which you can see today. The Cucumaletta is not in great shape. You can see it there in the photograph. It looks like it's been shaved across the top. And that's not only because it was um, you know, invaded, so to speak, by Bonaparte and explored later by Marcelliani, but because it was unfortunately damaged through agricultural work at the site, it seems. One of the tombs that Helbig describes, he says, lay near the south wedge, uh, southwest edge of the tumulus, but under, under the mound, but near its southwest edge. And the other, he says, was closer to its center. However, these were not part of the multi-chambered tomb that you see on these plans. So here on the left is a plan from the 1980s re-re-excavation of the tumulus. And you see the chambered tomb here. On the right is a map of by, or plan by Francesco Marcelliani himself. I'll say more about that in a second. But you see that it's not quite to scale, but he has a very large chamber tomb on his plan as well. That's not the tomb that Helbig is describing, however. He says, or he's describing instead, two stone-lined fossa tombs, that is, individual tombs containing a single inhumation burial. His plan on the right by Marcelliani is kept with some of his papers in the archives of the Museo Archeologico Nazionale in Florence, and also there are his unpublished notes of the excavation. So I checked those out. And in his notes, Marcelliani, excuse me, 
explains that he found Tumba Alfosa and Tumba Alpozzo, which are more well-shaped tombs, under the tumulus and circling the chamber tomb. And he says they are in area L of his particular drawing. So in other words, matching well with what Helbig himself is saying that his two tombs are under the tumulus and not outside it. Marcelliani, Marcelliani goes on to say that these uh, Tumbe Alfosa and Tumbe Alpezzo are at higher levels in the tumulus than the chamber tomb. So in other words, the implication is that they are later in date than the chamber tomb. And he even says that these later tombs are around the chamber tomb at a higher level. And he uses the word corona, Italian for crown, to describe the deposition, which implies that a level of respect for the earlier tomb and deciding where to put these later ones. He says that some of these fossa tombs contain buoni oggetti, beautiful objects. And very helpfully, he specifies that some had fasi affigure nere and campo rosso man pesti. So black figured vases, but in pieces. Again, according with what Helbig says, Helbig says that the two fossa tombs he is describing contain fragmentary black figured vases as well. Uh, unfortunately, Helbig uh, then goes on to describe the vases in detail, but Marcelliani does not. I was hoping to find the exact same description from Marcelliani, but he didn't describe any of the pieces in detail in the notes that I saw. Unfortunately, even between Helbig and Marcelliani and the 1980s excavation of part of the tumulus, it's not possible to pinpoint exactly where under the mound Helbig's two tombs are. And there are really two possibilities. If you take him very literally as referring to the southwest edge of the tumulus, they would have to be down here. However, um, more recently, I, I've started to wonder if maybe he means southwest edge of the chamber tomb, which would put them more sort of here, but there's no way to know that. I would like to take, the, thank, take this opportunity to thank Mario Riozzo, director of the Museo Archeologico Nazionale in Florence for his generosity in facilitating my access to Marcelliani's papers in June, 2019 and granting me permission to publish the drawing you see on the right in a recent article. Helbig says that the tomb he described as being closer to the mound's center contained a fragmentary Athenian black figured hydria. And as he had with the effector Zamfra from Tarquinia, he describes it in great detail down to the attributes of individual figures and notations of mission portions. Marcelliani, on the other hand, describes no specific vases in his excavation notes. In 2018, with the verification of curator Dennis Grain, using Helbig's description, I identified it as this fragmentary hydria and the Sanlung Antiper Kleinkunst of the Friedrich Schiller Universität in Jena, attributed by Beasley to the manner of the Lysipides painter. As with the effector amphora, information about this hydria's context and even the site from which it came was lost on the art market. Unlike the effector's amphora, however, there is no information about who owned it from its discovery in 1883 all the way up until the museum acquired it in the early 1950s. The Hydria's shoulder presents scenes of combat. A chariot wheels round to the viewer's left in the center, and you see framed by hoplite duels to left and right. In the duel to the right, where the right-hand figure is missing, the warriors are fighting over a bearded corpse stripped of his armor, whose wounds on torso, abdomen, and thigh gush blood rendered in added red glaze. The inscription Ophlos appears among them, you can barely make it out right there, elevating the combat to heroic heights. The Hydria's body features the apotheosis of Heracles to Mount Olympus by chariot, very familiar scene in late sixth century vase painting. In this variation, Heracles and his patron Athena stand together in the chariot with the goddess holding the reins and Heracles carrying his cub club. Typically of this scene type, they are joined by Teotes in an atmosphere of celebration. We have Dionysus mostly missing, but recognizable by his wreath and his drinking horn. Artemis is wearing a polos headdress and she has her quiver on her back. Apollo carries his kithra and Hermes is there at the front of the horses. The repetition of chariots in the body scene and the shoulder scene highlight a contrast in mood, a slow and stately procession versus very violent action on the shoulder, but also as Anne Steiner has 
talked about with repetition of motifs, we are invited as viewers to consider symbolic connections between the scenes. Perhaps we are meant, for example, to compare the kleos of the warriors on the shoulder with the kleos of Heracles, who is granted immortality for his glorious deeds. Heracles' Apotheosis by Chariot was an incredibly popular subject in Athenian base painting, appearing on a few vessels in the 550s, but really taking off from about 540 BCE onward. I have about 110 examples in my current research corpus. The great potter painter Exekius there on the left may have popularized or standardized the motif as seen on his amphora here from an Etruscan tomb as Orvieto, at Orvieto. As some of you know, this iconography has been subject to much discussion from an Athenian point of view, which I too discuss at more length in a recent article. Today, however, I would like to focus on the Etruscan reception of these scenes. As Warren Moon already observed back in 1983, the majority of surviving vases with this theme had been exported to Etruria, especially Amphorae and Hydriae. Even more specifically, Vulci received a lion's share of apotheosis by chariot vases, with just over 30 and my research corpus known to come from that site, although hardly any with documented context, and probably many more among vessels with unknown provenience. Vulci actually received the lion's share of shoulder hydriae, like you see on the right in general, coming from Athens, this shape having a strong local appeal, which traders and Athenian workshops sought to satisfy. And by the way, the shape there on the right would be the approximate shape of the fragmentary example from Jena. This scene's resonance in Etruria and the deposition of these vessels in Etruscan tombs can be explained, first of all, by a local reverence for Heracles, or Heracles, who was treated as god as much as hero in Etruria. Similarly, Minerva, or Athena, a very powerful and important goddess in Etruria. Secondly, the chariot as an enduring symbol of status in Etruria. And thirdly, the Etruscan belief in a voyage to the afterlife and the heroization of the deceased. One thinks, for example, of the placement of tiny model chariots and actual chariots in Etruscan tombs from early times, most famously, this example from the mid sixth century Motoleone di Spoleto in the Metropolitan Museum. Its decoration focuses on Achilles or Acle and even appears to depict his apotheosis. Two slightly later chariots found at Casa San Mariano near Perugia, ancient Perusia, feature scenes of Hercle, including what appears to be the introduction of Hercle to Tenya or Zeus on Olympus on a side panel. Acle and Hercle served as aspirational figures for the owners of those chariots in life and death, and it is easy to imagine Hercle on Athenian pottery carrying a similar meaning. At Vulci, where the majority of apotheosis by chariot vases have been found, we find the Tomb of the Bronze Chariot, found in 1965 in the Osteria necropolis north of the city, where the deceased had been cremated but supplied with a type of mannequin, reconstructed as having stood in the chariot. This is in the Villa Giulia, this display. The hands and heads are bronze, but the bodies would have been wooden and draped in textiles. It seems apparent that the mannequins symbolize revitalized and heroized versions of the deceased whose earthly bodies have been transformed through the act of cremation. Images of the deceased riding in Etruscan funerary art can be found in many mediums across many communities through the ages. So in wall painting, on cinerary art and sarcophagi, and so on. As for hair play, in Etruria, he was treated as a god more than a hero, not unlike Attica itself, where the worship of Heracles in Greece is said by ancient sources to have originated. His apotheosis can be found in Etruscan art, as for example, the so-called Ricci Hidria on the left from a tumulus tomb at Trivetri or Pyre, or a uniquely Etruscan scene on a bronze mirror, which I'm not showing you here, where he is suckled by Uni or Hera. He had further associations that he had either didn't have in Greece at all or were emphasized more than in Greece, for example, with water. On Etruscan mirrors and gems, you have a mirror there on the right, we see Hercle mastering nature and making water flow. Water sources of all kinds could be sacred to the Etruscans, and many sacred spaces were centered around water, whether natural springs or man-made pools. A sanctuary partly dedicated to Hercle in the Sant'Antonio area of Cairo had a spring and was the source of the very famous Athenian red-figured kylix with a votive inscription to Hercle, the incredible one with the Sack of Troy by Onesimos and Euphronios. 
Watered center shrines also existed at the Vulci, the site of our Yena Hydria, namely the Caraccio dell'Osteria sanctuary in the Osteria necropolis, and the Fontanile de Legnazina shrine, which is actually not far from the Cucca Maletta tumulus. A small bronze statuette of her clay was found among the votive offerings at the Fontanile de Legnazina. The prevalence of the so-called culto dell'acqua or cult of water at Vulci, I believe helps explain the large number of Athenian hydriae imported into this community and locally made figured hydriae as well. If more Athenian vases with apotheosis by chariot scenes had documented contexts in Etruria, we might be able to say more about their meaning. Unfortunately, the Yena Hydria is the only surviving example from Vulci with something close to a fully known fine spot. An amphora found by Marcebiani in a tomb neighboring the Cucumella tumulus, the bigger one, is described by Helbig in another report in the Burtino, but the vase itself has not been identified today. Believe me, I have looked for it. I suspect it is in the Torlonia collection, which many of you know is quite elusive and has yet to be opened to scholars. I've tried that too. We cannot know if the Yena Hydria was interred with a male or female deceased because Hydriae were associated with both in recently discovered Vulcan tombs and scenes of Heracle likewise in both male and female recently discovered tombs. We can, I think, contemplate the tumulus as a powerful site of memory and ritual action. If the information by Helbig and Marcelliani is correctly understood, these fossa tombs were added to the mound almost a century after its initial construction, for, whatever, for whatever reason made part of its very fabric instead of being situated outside of it. It is tempting to think the reasons involved the deceased him or herself, either that they were descendants of the initial family or that they themselves merited special treatment for some reason, and of course that's speculation. In such a context, however, Heracle or Heracles would have served as the ultimate symbol of transition and triumph. For our last case study, we move to inland Tuscany and to Foiana de la Chiana, whose Etruscan town was evidently rather small, although it's never been excavated, and fell under the influence of nearby Chiusi, which was another major city. In 1879, Giuseppe Campanelle of Putona and Giacomo Tempera of Betole conducted excavations on land belonging to Alfonso de Sodato at Foiano near the church of San Francesco, which you see there in this image, where they found part of an Etruscan cemetery and apparently dozens of tombs. They were visited by none other than Wolfgang Helbig, who published a brief report in the 1879 Bulletino, which you see there on the left. Helbig had arrived too late to witness the excavation of most of the tombs, and so they remain unrecorded. He does say that he saw dozens of black and red figured Greek vases in a storage area there. So we will never know if those vases out in the world somewhere came from Foyano. He did watch, however, the uncovering of two virgin tombs, as he calls them, and helpfully he recorded their contents in some detail. Both featured Athenian figured vases used as cinerary urns. All of them ended up on the art market uh, legally and are scattered around multiple museums today. Tomb one is very interesting and I discuss it in a couple of my publications, but I do want to mention that since my book, the, the last missing vase from Foyana tomb one, which I hadn't been able to find was found. It was part of a, the Passarini collection at one point it is now in the collection of the museum in Florence. Uh, so I thank Mario Ariozzi for telling me about that uh, very recently. That's a very exciting uh, discovery. Today, we are going to focus on the second of the two Foyano tombs. It consisted of one chamber, the other one had two, with an inhumation and a cremation burial, the former much earlier than the latter based on the grave goods. The skeleton, which lay on a bench, was accompanied by two Etruscan bronze jugs on the floor, many Bucaro vase fragments, according to Helbig, and eggshells, the latter remaining from the funerary feast and heavenly symbolic. None of those objects, unfortunately, has been identifiable today. The cremation burial, however, was placed against the left wall looking from the doorway. This is a drawing I commissioned for my book right away, uh, by the way. According to Helbig, the cremation burial was housed in a red-figured amphora with banquet scene. It was joined by a red-figured kylix with scenes of the departures of warriors on the interior and one exterior side and athletes on the other exterior side. 
The cup, which could be either Greek or Etruscan based on its description, does remain unidentified today. But I tracked down the alleged emperor in 2014 through Helbig's detailed description and again, the Beasley Archive Pottery Database. So thank you, Oxford. Turns out it's not an emperor. It is an attic red figure column crater attributed to the Naples painter and dating from around 440 BCE, so a bit later than the two other vases we've seen today. It is in the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, having been acquired by Henry Walters in 1902 as part of the collection of Don Marcello Mazarenti. Mazarenti had previously displayed his Greek and Roman artworks and his even larger collection of Renaissance and Baroque paintings in rented rooms of the Palazzo Coromboni near the Vatican, and Walters bought all of it. And so it is in the Walters Art Museum, the core of their collection, we could say. Mazarenti published a catalog of his collection of vases in 1897 and his other antiquities. It includes a brief description of this crater, but unfortunately gives no information about where, when, or from whom he bought it, nor does the name Foyana della Chiana appear in his catalog as its provenience. As with our previous two examples, that information had simply been lost. The crater depicts a symposium scene on its obverse and a conversation scene on its reverse. Three men recline on clean eye in the symposium, entertained by a female musician playing the double aulos or pipes. The man at right originally held a red bit of ivy vine for making a wreath, indicated in added red, red paint that has now mostly flaked away. The young man in the center seems enraptured by the music, gazing intently at the pipe player's face and with his arm gracefully draped over his head. Symposium scenes like this one are common on mid fifth century vases, including others by the Naples painter himself. Given that craters were used as mixing vessels for wine and water at the symposium, their popularity for this shape in Athens among Athenian workshops is not surprising at all. Many Athenian vases with the subject, however, were exported like this one, not only to Etruria, but across the Mediterranean, which inspires consideration of the motif in other contexts. In Etruscan funerary art, one does not have to look far to find scenes of banquets. The ceramic cinerary urn there on the left from the seventh century BCE is one of the earliest such images surviving today. Here, the participants are seated as is typical in the earliest Etruscan images of banquets. With influence from the Near East and possibly from Greece as well, reclining is introduced and we find numerous scenes of figures reclining at banquet in all mediums across all parts of Etruria for centuries, including the famous Tomb of the Leopards there on the right that I mentioned a little earlier. I am quite deliberately, by the way, saying banquet and not symposium, speaking of the Etruscan occasions, because they are quite different. In the region of the Val di Chiana, which includes Chiusi and Foyana della Chiana, there is likewise a long and strong tradition of banqueting references in funerary settings. We see this in tomb assemblages, including the famous seventh century so-called and very incorrectly named canopic jars where the cremated dead are revitalized and given equipment for feasting, like you see in this example at the top. We also see banqueting scenes on cinerary urns of various kinds, including this sixth century example from Chiusi, which is in the museum in Florence. In Foyana tomb two itself, the earlier deceased, the inhumed person, was interred with bucoro and bronze vessels recalling the banquet, and I mentioned eggshells in the original report from Helbig. Our fifth century column crater has thus been entruscanized into a very long-standing local funerary tradition. Its deposition together with the cup evokes the banquet through the choice of shape, and its imagery certainly does. I would go farther and note that the subject matter of the crater and the lost cup together recall a cuisine masculine ideal for the cup did depict athletes and departing warriors. Banqueting, athletics and soldiering together rank among the most common scene types in cuisine funerary art. We cannot be sure of course that the deceased is male so I'm not gonna go that far but as elsewhere the imagery is very suggestive. As with the effector amphora that we discussed earlier from almost a century, uh, in fact, almost exactly a century earlier, being able to now identify a site for the Naples painter's crater 
does contribute to discussion about distribution, again, with my usual caveat about preservation bias. About 100 years after the earliest phase of the effector's career, however, we do see a different situation in terms of trade routes and in terms of distribution. Granted, many more attributed column craters besides these lack a known site or provenient, but of those that do, none were found in Southern Etruria, which previously had received so many Athenian pottery. That area now is still receiving some, but not, not to the same quantities at all. Instead, we find the Naples painters' vases in Sicily, in Puglia on Italy's eastern coast, and sites in northern Italy under Etruscan influence, like Spina and Bologna, ancient Felsina. So there is Bologna, there is Spina. It is not surprising to find so many of his vases at Spina at all. Spina received very large amounts of Athenian figure pottery at this time. We could posit that this painters and other vases may have traveled from Spina following routes extending to Bologna. And now we have this example from Foyano, which is down here further south. The distribution of Naples painters vases echoes a pattern for Attic vases in general in Italy in the fifth century with trade routes favoring Sicily and the Adriatic coast more than Southern Etruria and the Tyrrhenian coast. Since there was a greater variety of possibilities where a workshop's vases not, might go, not just in Italy, but also expanded trade in the Black Sea, in Spain and elsewhere in the Eastern and Western Mediterranean with both Greek and non-Greek populations in play, it would be in a workshop's and trader's best interest to produce and transport vases with potentially broad appeal. A crater was a safe bet because both Greeks and non-Greeks -Greek would be participating in banquets or symposia. And therefore we find column craters and bell craters heavily exported in this time period and into the fourth century. A symposium scene is a very safe bet for the same reason, because it would have a very broad appeal. The majority of column creators by the Naples painter, with some noteworthy exceptions, have banqueting or Dionysian scenes. This trio of examples from Spina, with a documented uh, context there on the left um, from a documented excavation, uh, Fuano della Chiana with a sort of documented fine spot, and one said to be from Conversaro Nibari in Puglia, there on the right, um, the latter also probably from a non-Greek tomb. These three show how the Naples painter varied compositions, but did use replica figures to expedite production. Unlike the effector whose vases seem to have been met exclusively for export, at least based on the current distributions, the Naples painter did also decorate vases for the home market. So I want to mention that, namely nuptial vases, wedding vases, whose shapes were for the most part specific to Athens and Attica with, of course, exceptions. The other Greece on my chart here, and this is a very loose chart, admittedly, includes the Renea deposit on Dulos, which was under Athenian influence. And the collection histories under the unknowns that you have on my chart, including this one in the Metropolitan, do allow for fine spots in Attica. The scenes on these vases reflect their function, being very female and very domestic in character. One of the Naples painters, Lutoforo, however, features an unusual scene of the preparation of a body for a funeral, which shows the painter's knowledge of the local Athenian custom to sometimes use Lutoforo as funerary vessels. Another shows an Amazonomachy, the so-called warrior Lutoforo being associated with the male war dead. To maintain a steady living in this period, it seems logical that workshops would produce figured vases for local consumption as well as export. In the case of Naples Painter, we again see a craftsman who was aware, and his potter as well, of what all of his customers wanted and tailored production accordingly. Our three case, case studies cannot tell us everything we would like to know. We are still missing the exact fine spots on the ground, and we will never have the remains of the deceased with information about gender or age. We also cannot interview the owners of the vases to learn why they were purchased, whether they were used before being placed in the tomb or why they were chosen for that purpose. Ultimately, every object is part of a very personal and unknowable story. Even so, particularly with the new information that does come with provenance research, I think we can use these vases as examples of the Etruscanization of Athenian pottery and of our key concepts of mobility, transformation, intentionality, and dialogue. 
whether a tumba abuca, as with the effector amphora, a tumba afosa within the tumulus, as with the yena hydria, or a chamber tomb, as with the Naples painter's vase, whether at Tarquinia or Vulce or Friano or elsewhere, Etruscan tombs were liminal spaces, sites of memory and sites of passage. Athenian painted vases and other local or imported grave goods functioned actively within these spaces and the funeral rites and the funeral rites to help the deceased negotiate their transition to the afterlife. In terms of the pottery, imagery as well as shape played a role in this process and in the selection of vases for usage and deposition. The choice to use a vessel as a cinerary urn, I would suggest, bore a heightened significance. Purposeful actions carried out by Etruscan consumers, whether at home, in the sanctuary, or in the cemetery, in turn had a ripple effect, with the result that consumers, traders, and workshops engaged in a very symbiotic relationship, the desires and decisions of one group feeding very much off another. Recognizing this relationship does not diminish the influence or the agency of the Athenian workshops, but acknowledges the agency of everyone involved. I conclude by reflecting very briefly on this word context, the theme of our webinar series. The words lost, missing, and unknown, and unfortunately have recurred throughout my talk, highlighting the material and intellectual consequences, to use David Gill's phrase, of 19th century antiquarian explorations and more recent looting when it comes to archeological context. Being able to identify a site and at least partly complete the biographies of these three vases that I discussed has brought me great personal satisfaction, but significantly does add to our knowledge of their consumption, distribution, and production. And there is more to find. Other scholars have likewise been engaging in archival and provenance research with fascinating results, and work on old unpublished excavation notes and materials continues. Related to this is recent work on the history of collections of the modern reception of vases and how the stories of these vessels continued after discovery, whatever form that discovery took. That is context too. The so-called contextual turn in art historical inquiry has expanded and enriched the study of Greek painted pottery as much as it has other subfields. I hope today I've given you a little taste of where these investigations might go. Thank you for your kind attention and thank you again to the American School for the invitation. Thank you, Pro Professor Bantrick, for this uh, stimulating and highly nuanced um, exploration of a fascinating subject. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I think I should uh, repeat here um, your four pillars, your four fundamental qualities and the interaction as you identified them between um, Greeks and Etruscans and back to the Greeks, uh, mobility of the material transformation of the iconography, but also the shapes when moved to Etruria, intentionality in the decoration and the, the usage of, um, of the vases, and the dialogue between, between the, um, the two. Um, also, I must say, wh while I was, I was um, listening to your, to your paper, I thought of something completely different um, from, a, from a, an altogether different context. I watched a documentary at some point um, on uh, Nigerian art from the 18th and 19th century. Um, and there was um, a, a representative of a, of a Nigerian museum who said that um, they, in fact, do not want the Nigerian objects exported or looted away from Nigeria to France or elsewhere to go back to Nigeria because they are now, according to him, they were um, African. They were, they, they, were, they were no more African, they were European, uh, which is something along the lines of what you said with, um, mm -hmm. um, with um, uh, Athenian, Athenian pottery uh, being transformed, completely become um, Etruscan um, uh, in, uh, through, through Etruscan um, usage. Um, so thank you uh, for this. Uh, before we open the Q&A session, let me remind everyone that next week, uh, Professor Jennifer Niles will take us back to Athens um, with uh, her own uh, lecture on the gigantomachy on the Athena Parthenos shield. As you, um, most of you should probably know, this was uh, a painting, uh, one of the uh, most famous painting uh, from classical antiquity, which, however, 
has not survived. Um, so I think it's time to, to open the Q&A session. Uh, we'll start with my favorite uh, VAS expert, um, Professor Evridiki Kefalidou from the University of Athens. Um, uh, she thanks uh, Professor Bantrick for this great lecture. Um, and she has a question about the attic shapes um, uh, the Etruscan chose uh, to use as urns. Um, many of them, she says, have a rather small opening, which makes it somehow difficult to insert the burnt uh, remains. Do we have any evidence on uh, perhaps cutting off uh, a piece of these vases, uh, the amphoras mostly? Uh, if not, why didn't they purchase more craters, for example? That is a, a really great question, and I don't have a good answer for it. And I wondered the exact same thing. It's fascinating because, in fact, in Foyana de la Chiana, tomb one, one of the vases used as a cinerary urn is a hydria. So that's even more difficult. Uh, how in the world would you do that? It would be very, it would be challenging and messy, one can assume. So the, the choices of shapes are quite diverse, which again comes to this, this theory that the amphora shape was quite purposely tied perhaps to the shape of the biconical urns and meant deliberately to evoke that. But then you do find craters once in a while and the Europa and the bull crater is a great example of that. That crater does have ancient repairs around the bottom, in fact, uh, but they don't seem to be perhaps tied at all to deposing the dead because they didn't need to. It is true that at Tarquinia, they practiced uh, communition, meaning that they uh, ground the bones of the dead up even more. Um, and we know that this was a practice. And if we have any Etruscologists in the chat, they could probably talk much more about that than I can. But that would have assisted somewhat in, in being able to um, put the remains inside these amphorae, but that is an excellent point, and, and I don't have a good answer. <laughs> but, and which makes me wonder, though, if the scenes on the vases did play an important role in a lot of cases, that the imagery on the vase was so compelling and somehow more meaningful that it made up for any challenge or any difficulty. I think we need to keep that possibility in mind. Thank you so much for your question, and hello. <laughs> Well, as, as you, you already said, um, iconography has its own agency, so we must, we must keep this in mind anyway. Um, uh, a question on the effect uh, and, uh, and uh, his statistics. Um, uh, considering that in Etruria, the vases entered a closed funerary context and that their Athenian Greek counterpart stayed in current use and trust uh, uh, away once uh, and damaged, would it be possible to calibrate the numbers in the statistics with an estimation of the production of a workshop? Is it possible to estimate the production of these workshops? Oh gosh, that's a huge question too. Um, well, first of all, I freely acknowledge that there is this uh, great disparity and this huge preservation bias between these two areas, Athens and Etruria because of the places where these vases tend to be found. That is absolutely the case. I would also add to that, that in Etruria itself, there is a huge bias because people were honestly raiding tombs um, in the 19th century. That's where they were looking. Um, whereas sanctuaries and domestic sites are not as well preserved and have not been as well explored and have not been fully published in some cases. But there are some new publications in recent years of sanctuaries like Gravisca, for example, in the attic pottery there, which is correcting the balance somewhat in talking about Etruscan things, a very important correction because in very old scholarship, the assumption was that the Etruscans only put them in tombs. But that's not true. Um, the Etruscans put, use them in homes and put them in sanctuaries as well. And the ancient repairs on some of those found in tombs may well have been done in Etruria, particularly if they're made in bronze, that seems to be an indicator of some kind. In Athens, we do have this totally different situation. And it could well be that if the archaic agora is discovered and dug up, that we find lots of vases by the effector, which will totally 
change our perspective or an archaic cemetery that would um, have vases in it that would change the proportions of things and change the story. So I'm always careful to say, well, based on what we know now. Um, so there is that. And because of all of these problems, coming up with numbers is very hard. And the scholarship on the amount of surviving vases today is quite vast. And there have been some very interesting recent discussions uh, by Philip Saperstein, by Vladimir uh, Stisi. If either of them are watching, hello, thank you for your work. Um, because they have written, for example, recently about this, a number of scholars have. So the proportion of surviving vases is very small and it is skewed, which makes exact numbers hard. And there's also the problem of said to be from such and such place, um, that problem as well. So I, I put many disclaimers in my in my publications about this. And I try to be have, you know, have disclaimers when I'm talking about my charts, but they're suggestive anyway. And I admit I have not run a you know, chi-square analysis on the effectors distribution, but I bet if I did, I would find that the pattern that we see is probably not coincidental. Um, but again, that's hard. That's hard to be sure. But that's a great question, a really good question. Thank you. Um, I, I know you you talked about a dialogue between the Etruscans and the Athenians, but there's a question on, on that. Uh, I wonder, they say, how much you think the individual Athenian potters and painters were crafting their personal style with very specific Etruscan towns in mind? Mm. Ah. This also very good question. Um, and in my opinion, there is a spectrum of responses to the situation in Etruria. I think it's inevitable that the Athenian workshops are very aware of the Etruscan export market. They're making a lot of money off of it. They know where vases are going. How they respond to that knowledge, I think varies a great deal. On the one hand, you do have, and I didn't mention them because I, I was worried about my time, but I, I knew the question would come. Um, the, you have the Nicosthenic workshop, you have the Parazoma group, you have workshops and painters who seem to be tailoring their choices of shape and or imagery more closely to specific knowledge of the Etruscans. The Parazoma group is a very good example where you have athletes who are wearing loincloths, the kind of classic example that Alan Shapiro has talked about, for instance. And in fact, some of the vases from the Parazoma group have commercial trademarks under the feet that um, there are something like six from the same workshop. And I'm afraid that was a while ago I wrote that part of the book. So I forget the number, but it's something like six of Parazoma group vases with the same trademark, which suggests um, some level of coordination there or some dialogue between the a trader and the workshop. So you might have a workshop like that. And the Nicosthenic workshop, same thing. Um, Jennifer Tafe is doing a dissertation and new dissertation on that workshop, which will be very exciting. Um, where we do see the specific shapes being geared to, it seems, you know, Pyre, for instance, a certain kind of amphora. So we do have some very specific cases like that. But I think in a lot of instances, it is less specific, but no less unaware, I think, of the Etruscan market. By that, I mean, suppose the trader reports to the workshop or the workshop just notices that um, vases with Ericles and the chariot are selling really well. I'm going to make more of them because people are asking me for these. Or maybe the trader comes back and says, you know, those were selling really well, but the ones with the birds, not so much. The workshop might not uh, make as many of the ones that are going to sell. And, th and that, as I mentioned, lessens the degree of risk on everyone's part um, to use some ancient form of market research. And I know I, many are going to be horrified that I'm using very modern terms, but I do think it's a useful way to understand the dynamic. And so it's very easy to look at that and say, well, see, the Etruscans had no influence at all. But if they are making more of the vases, if they are making more of that scene and more of the certain shapes they know Etruscans will like, that is another way in which the Etruscan consumers are impacting Athenian production. Now, I do want to say, that uh, a distress that I'm not at all claiming that the Athenian workshops were uh, indebted to the Etruscan market so much that they did not go out on a limb and be innovative, because I think they also could use the knowledge that they had to be innovative. So, for example, suppose a workshop knows that the Etruscans like oversized cups, and this is something that Athena 
uh, Zangarita published about very, very recently in the AJA, and I've talked about in my book, I'm very indebted to Athena's uh, earlier work on this, um, they will keep making oversized cups and maybe make them with special techniques uh, and will make them extra big and extra fancy and maybe a, a new scene that they haven't seen before as a way to entice a trader or for the trader to entice a consumer. And in that way, the Athenian workshops are helping to drive the market. And so that is another form of dialogue. And we certainly see that in modern uh, consumerism all the time, the new iPhones that keep coming oh, up. Certainly, I mean, the, the local, localized produ products are a sign of a globalized uh, mm -hmm. market. Mm -hmm. um, so I agree with you on that, uh, totally. Uh, perhaps Professor uh, Niles would like to ask a question? Sure, I would. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy, for, especially for that sleuthing and finding and re recontextualizing these vases. That's really great. I want to just open it up a little more in the Etruscan t context in your um, intentionality uh, category here, because um, as someone who's worked in Etruria, I see a, I see a broader perspective here than just the funerary one. And just for instance, your first vase from Tarquinia um, that has these seat, these gods, the throne gods, and other gods on it. Um, it reminds me, as as I'll get to another minute, um, you know. Iconography like the um, Merlot frieze plaques, where you get seated divinities, and so this is already something earlier on. This is early. This is earlier in the sixth century in the Etruscan sphere of of iconography, and uh, you know, in the realm of either it's religion or whether they're elites. Um, then um, you have the the chariot scene, and um, of course, there's procession scenes on the Murillo frieze plaques. But I'm thinking also of Etruscan tombs, I mean, after all, Athena is driving this chariot, even though Heracles or Heracles is on it. And we have Etruscan tombs of women with chariots. And um, we know that women from other contexts and things drove, drove chariots in Etruria. They were more liberated women, presumably. And um, so that kind of jibe resonates with that. And finally, the... Um, the banquet scenes, of course, again, on the Etruscan, I mean, Merlot frieze plaques and other frieze plaques, are, they love these banqueting scenes. So it's, again, part of elite life, just as it is, of course, in the tomb paintings. But so I just wonder if there isn't a, a, a somewhat bigger opening out of looking at this imagery and why it appeals to the Etruscans. Um, I know you've concentrated on you know, the, the painters within the painter's workshop, but I think, um, as I say, that there's sort of a broader way of looking at it. And um, it would be nice if we knew more about the inhabitants of the tomb, because then we could make more intelligent guesses about whether there were gendered choices, say, in shapes. I mean, we think of the hydria, and of course, in the Greek context as a vase for women. But you know that may not have been true in, as true in Eturia, but it would be interesting to, to learn more about that. And, and you said there was a cup with athletes on it. Um, and again, of course, athletic scenes and competitions are very popular. And Ann Steiner and I wrote about the, you know, the para, painter of the Paris Gigantomachy and all these boxing scenes that are found everywhere in Etruria. And I just wondered if maybe that, maybe that's a book cut by the um, painter of the Paris um, uh, Gigantomachy. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Clearly, <laughs> the um, the black figured cup that was found in the other fossa tomb in the tumulus at Vulci had oh, boxers yeah. on it. Um, yeah. So, so that, exactly right. I mean, and I did concentrate on funerary imagery today and my book is very heavily skewed towards funerary material as well because it was just easier to do with the word count that I had. <laughs> uh, but absolutely right. I mean, these are images that resonate far beyond just that context. And, and going back to this idea of vases having multiple lives, many of them being used in life before being placed in the tomb, they can change you know, meaning and be transformed going from life to death in the same Etruscan family um, and being a possession of someone. And we also have examples of vases in Etruscan tombs where the other grave goods are much later than the vase, suggesting that maybe it was in the family for an extended period of time. There's a very, very interesting tomb uh -huh. from 
Perugia with an example of that, and, and also Trivetri, so-called heirlooms. Uh, so it is a shame that we don't have more demographic information because I think those patterns would be very interesting to learn. So we have to speculate and go out as far as we can can on the limb and then just say, well, it's tempting to say this, but we can't be sure. It is true that a, a few recent excavations of tombs at um, Vulci do show that Hydriae were placed in both male and female tombs. I briefly mentioned that. Um, those tombs have been preliminarily published. Um, one is known as the tomb of the Cultibos, the other one, the tomb of the Macaulay painter vases. They both have Hadriae, and one is a male and one is a female tomb based on the forensic um, analysis, preliminary forensic analysis. So that is quite interesting. And it, it does remind us that the usage of vases in different places can be different. We can't assume one thing for another location. And your article, by the way, I loved. It was such a good article with, with Anne um, and, and did this kind of analysis for something found in a sanctuary. But you were very lucky. You had a documented find spot and could create a much richer story than one could do with something found in the 19th century. It's true. Thank you. Since, since you mentioned heirlooms just now, I have a question from uh, fellow Oxonian Philip Kaplan. Um, you have adopted the model of commercial exchange for explaining the movement of these vases to Etruria. Um, could gift exchange have played a role in the sixth and fifth centuries? As Xenia, these objects would have held some status based on their exotic provenance. Well, we certainly can't rule that out and I won't rule that out at all. Uh, it, just like I, um, Put it at the end of the talk, ultimately we have very personal stories for the vases and the people. So one of the vases could easily be a gift from a friend or a souvenir from a trip uh, from the Etruscans, uh, Etruscan uh, person going over to Athens for some reason and coming back with a souvenir. And there could be lots of models for how vases are acquired, but the scale of the trade in the sixth and fifth centuries, which is massive, suggest that that would not be the only way that things would get to Etruria. Now, I do suspect that earlier on in the seventh century with something like a Kijiope or in the early sixth century leading up to around 540, 530, where you have fewer imports in Etruria, you might have more of this gift exchange scenario. Some, some very beautiful uh, black figure vases found in tombs at Chiusi, for example, or Cortona uh, from preceding this, this big um, expansion of the, of the commercial trade, those may have been acquired through more gift exchange scenarios. Uh, but I also think even in the earlier period, you might have traders trying things out and sort of bringing a few things to see how it goes. Uh, but then the word gets out and the trade just grows. But the volume um, means it can't be random in my, peer, in my opinion and has to be organized to an extent. And, and shipwrecks uh, are, are somewhat helpful in this regard, although uh, I hate to say sadly, because you don't want to wish for shipwrecks, but um, there are no shipwrecks with a big haul of Athenian figured pottery off the coast of Italy, but there is the shipwreck with a big haul of Athenian figured pottery off the coast of France uh, from this uh, late sixth century time period, which is showing the large number of vases that are traveling. But I do think there's a mix of possibilities. There are lots of stories, um, and that's what we can't know, are the individual stories. That's a great question, and I do think it's important to keep in mind. Well, since, since you mentioned uh, movement of, of, of artists, do we have any uh, evidence for uh, this for, for, for potters? Uh, there is some evidence about painters uh, in mm -hmm. Gervisca. There are some dedications of people from Ionia who may have gone to Turia mm -hmm. through Egypt. Um, do we have any evidence of uh, actual Athenians working in uh, in Etruria? Oh, Not Ionians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, Athenians. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you know, sound evidence, uh, no suspicions, yes. Um, and this is something a bit outside of what I personally have been doing. I know there are other scholars uh, working on this. 
exact topic right now. Certainly for the fifth century, there is more suspicion of Athenian potters and painters migrating to other places, including in South Italy and establishing workshops. But in terms of the, uh, what we would call here in America, the smoking gun, the absolute evidence that this happened, no, there is such a, not such a thing. But a suspicion I think is, is out there and it wouldn't surprise me any because mobility can extend of course, the people. And so we are having that dialogue and having that mobility could easily include craftsmen. Um, and that includes Etruscan craftsmen traveling to Athens and maybe the Nicosthenic uh, workshop learning how to make those fantastic, very distinctive amphorae that seem so indebted to Bukoro vessels, um, perhaps being shown that by an Etruscan craftsman or at least seeing an Etruscan vase. So there were certain that I think the dialogue and the mobility could easily extend to that as well especially since you very correctly pointed out that Athenian uh, uh, vase painters were not all, always born in, in mm -hmm. Athens. Mm -hmm. um, another question on, 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 mark, on the market and the, the mechanisms of the market in those days. How do you account for the changing trade patterns you note away from Tyrrhenian Italy and towards Sicily and the Adriatic? If there was a symbiotic relationship between Athenian producers, middlemen, and southern Etruscan consumers, why do you think this largely stopped in the fifth century? Well, this is a uh, historical mystery, um, I think it's safe to say, um, and different reasons have been suggested for why trade routes could have shifted. One of those that has been mentioned in the past many times is that the Battle of Kumi in 474 uh, and the conflict uh, between Etruria and Syracuse di disrupted somehow the trade patterns. But it's interesting because uh, recent publications have suggested that the trade didn't die out as much as it has initially appeared. Elisa Maroni, for example, published a wonderful catalog of red-figured pottery, Athenian red-figured pottery from Tarquinia a few years ago, and I wrote it up in a review for Etruscan and Italic Studies. It was a, a wonderful work. And she cataloged a lot of material that was in the storerooms in the museum in Tarquinia that had not previously been published. And it's actually a lot of material. And some of the vases are extremely high quality, many of which had been known previously, but there were lots of other things too, Al Scufoy and other sorts of vases. So maybe they weren't the super fanciest material making its way at that point to a place like Tarquinia, but it, the trade was not totally gone. So it could be that once more, our preservation bias is influencing what we're seeing, that is true. But I do think the trade routes changed. I think you know, markets open up for a number of reasons. The word gets out. Um, I did see an interesting article or a little article in the New Etruscan News by Nancy de Grummond, who threw out there the possibility of a pandemic or some other sort of event in Etruria in the fifth century that may have caused um, a disruption of many sorts of things in that time period. And, and I thought that was very interesting to introduce that because people have always zoomed in on battles. Uh, so there could be another explanation, uh, but without hard evidence, we can't know. It could have been you know, commercial uh, competition. Maybe the workshops in Etruria were, were so much competition that the Athenian or the traders working with them rather pulled back a little bit and went towards areas where there was less competition. There could be a number or maybe a mix of explanations, but that is a, that's a fascinating question and one I pondered a great deal but can't answer. Um, several people, and John Mertens is one of them, uh, are asking about contents of the vases. Uh, she says, you speak only about shapes and iconography mm -hmm. and the commerce between Athens and Etruria. That's the question. How about any contents in the vases? Were there any? Well, these ones found in the 19th century, uh, I assume have been washed out and do not have contents available for analysis, or at least no, I was not made aware of those um, in my work. And I think that's a huge problem with anything that was found a long time ago. Uh, the In terms of more recent analysis, I don't know that they've done a content analysis, for example, of these recently excavated tombs of Vulci that I mentioned, they're not fully published. Um, so I don't know if they have, but that would be wonderful to know if there are traces of wine or olive oil or something that would make that clear. Um, 
So I don't have an answer for that. And a big problem with that is the Antiquity Levesas. And hello, Joan. <laughs> hello, hello from me too. Um, oh, a similar question along the same lines. Um, do you have any thoughts about whether or how many of these vases were used uh, for some period of time before the position in the, in the tomb? So in Etruria. Mm -hmm. Well, again, there's no way to statistically figure that out. Uh, but I think when you have the vases with ancient repairs, that is very suggestive. And some of the repairs, the metal is missing and the metal would be enormously helpful. Um, Susan Rotroff has suggested um, that lead repairs would be more appropriate to have been done in Athens, bronze repairs and Etruria. It might not be as simple as that, but that's certainly a great pattern to work with, to begin with. And if the metal is gone, that's not very helpful. Uh, but nonetheless, the idea of many vases being used in life before you putting put in the tombs, this makes sense to me. Uh, it makes sense to me that you would have this object that carried meaning in these multiple spheres and that meant something to the people. And, and that is the ultimate unknowable thing are the feelings people have. Um, the feelings and the thoughts and the calculation of, of you know, a business calculation or in terms of pure emotional feelings. And we are talking about tombs, we're talking about families, we're talking about loved ones who've died. Um, being emotionally connected to an object or having some memory connected to an object is the thing that we won't find ever. Um, and so those personal stories are allow for so many different scenarios in terms of how those vases were used, them being displayed in the home. Uh, and in the case of these so-called heirlooms being something special that was passed down um, through the centuries and that meant something or through the decades of, and that meant something to someone. I think those stories were certainly there. And those new and more recent attention to domestic sites um, and certainly open those possibilities. And with, as those publications keep happening, we could posit those sorts of things. And there it will be interesting to see the distribution of scene types and to see and to look and to think about scene types in sanctuaries and tombs and houses. Um, and there is a resonance there, as Jennifer pointed out, these subjects like chariots, like athletes are not unique to funerary settings. They have a broader perspective. Um, so the more we learn, the more we will be able to glimpse those stories, I think. I think this time just for one last question uh, from Professor okay. Palothodros, my colleague. Uh, concerning uh, your last case study, the cup, he says, cannot be Etruscan unless the crater was a heirloom because Etruscan red figure does not exist in the 440s. Description of the scenes brings to my mind cups by the Codrus painter. Mm. Uh, do we have evidence of attic vases used as urns that have been heirlooms in Etruria as opposed to in Athens, for example, the tomb of um, Aristion? Um, that's a great question. Um, and without the missing cup, it'd be a little hard, I think, to answer that one. I did think of the Codrus painter actually reading the description as well. Um, uh, that's, that is an unanswerable question, in my opinion, because of the problem of evidence, uh, but it's certainly a possibility. And I suspect the cup is Attic and Helbig, I believe even describes it as Attic. Um, and so I don't think it's an heirloom, but it um, could well be by someone associated with the Codrus painter or some, something related to that workshop, who of course did export a lot of vases to Etruria uh, as well, including at Spina and things like this. For sure. Uh, also a remark from the, uh, also from Professor Palothodoros, he says that lost lids of amphorae is an indication that the vases were used before um, the position mm -hmm. that they were around Absolutely. for some time. Absolutely. So uh, perhaps Professor Niles would like to say a few words before we we end. Sure. I just I'll I'll join all the people on chat who have thanked you for a fascinating talk. And um, we really appreciate that you contributed to our series on ancient painting and took us away from, you know, the mainland of Greece to Etruria to show us how um, these Greek painted vases resonated with a, a, a totally different audience and, and attained new meetings in that way. So this has been a very enlightening lecture. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, she has a new book coming out so um, soon, so look, look for that. It's about domestic. <laughs>
our domestic context. So, so thank you again, and thank you to all the audience members who joined in and sent in excellent questions. I know we didn't get to them all, but we'll, um, but uh, we hope most of your most of them were answered. And please join us next week when I'm up <laughs> to to talk about take us back to Athens and to the Parthenon. Thank you very much.